Hey, y'all. Welcome. Welcome back to Interstage Window, my Saturday stream, which is a stream with my friends. And I have here today with me, Landon. Say hi, Landon. Hi, Landon. <laughs> and welcome in, Lunar, with the first. Okay. So after we have our um kind of podcast talk today, I want you to tell me all about how the concert was. I want to hear all about it. Okay. Ugh, so I definitely jealous. want to know. <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm, I have to wait until June to go. <laughs> Uh, want to know all the things mm -hmm. yeah for sure you want to spoil sure. what songs I don't know what songs she sang last night so if you just want to let me know what two songs that she said anyway <laughs> <laughs> uh, I feel like I am a Swifty by proxy between you and Lunar I am like um like a like a Swifty by marriage you know <laughs> yes you are I feel like you truly are a Swifty by marriage I mm -hmm. love that <laughs> Yes, yes. But um but Taylor Taylor Swift decided we can talk about Taylor Swift after our main topic. But what is our main topic today, Landon? We're here for part two of Death Note. Mm -hmm. da -da 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 mm -hmm. I don't know what that sound effects was, but I imagine cannons were going off in my head. <laughs> <laughs> yes so the topic of today is death note part two is bad actually and here's yeah, why it's, it's terrible <laughs> it's so bad we're there is no trying to hold back here uh no. and it's not bad in the way that we were like by the time we got to book seven of harry potter we were like this is so bad please put us out of our misery this is just bad taste bad done bad storyline we're gonna talk <laughs> about all it. the things we're gonna, we're gonna talk we're gonna talk about it so let me show you guys this uh let me show you guys this beautiful this beautiful deck here yeah rule 37 the person who finishes death note is now cursed with the wish that death note was only 25 episodes hey smasha we love when we hate things too how are you doing friend i can't believe you're here for the death note <laughs> Uh oh, it looks like um the zoom may be froze for landon that's okay so i will tell you guys um a little bit so for Death Note, we are like, talking kind about of how they did it. Oh, Hello, no. there we go. Oh, am I oh, back? You're back. You're back. <laughs> oh, thank God. Oh, thank guess God. Guess who's Guess who's here to talk about Death Note? Our, <gasps> our friend, Sasha? the one and only Sasha. <laughs> you're here. The hatred I soothes me. It. Well, is this okay. I will warn you because you know we usually try to do try to find the positive. Um, and so we try to do like you know 50 50 hating and loving. This is like. 95% Hayden. So get ready. <laughs> yeah. No, as I was saying, I was like, man, it just would have been better if they Moriarty and Sherlock off of a cliff. Like just I mean, fight and L just after episode 25. Yeah. But here we are, yeah. cursed with uh They should have the exactly Sasha. They should have Hannibal yeah. hugged and just oh, yeah. off the cliff. Just we that would have been so much better. <laughs> we are cursed with the capitalistic uh sort of sense of wanting to continue a series that should have ended. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So we're gonna talk all about that. Um, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna talk all about that today. So let's start with favorite things. <gasps> well, <laughs> our favorite things are nothing. Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> uh there I couldn't come up with one single thing that I liked about this season. Yes. Uh at all. <laughs> like I it was I at least like here's the thing. We all know I'm not a weeb. So like getting me to watch the anime in the first place, really difficult, really hard. She gets one a year. One a year. And as we entered this, I was like, man, I'll find something to love. And I found nothing. And then Karen's like, I too hate it. Yes. So, okay. So here's the deal. This is the one thing I like about part two, the concept. Okay. So as we talked about last week with Death Note part one, um, it was kind of happenstance that the authors created such a political conceit with the Death Note. That was not the point of it. But you can imagine as a writer, you 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 write your the story that you want to write and then you realize like, oh, shit. We actually have to like politically explore this. This is not optional. And if I was them, I would feel this way too. But the problem is, is that is not how it was originally conceived. So now we've got this more political take on Death Note, which like in my mind, like I want this. I'm like, yeah, actually, I want to understand like the political ramifications of something like the Death Note. Um, but because it was never conceived that way, the execution of it is just bad. It's just bad, it, actually. It wasn't built in. It was like trying no. to fit pieces here, there, and everywhere. It was like it was like playing Jenga with two completely different board games. Yes. Yes. <laughs> like it really was. Yeah. 
So we ta- we've talked often um, on this show about how like when authors don't think the politics of their work through the results that happen. And Death Note, I think, is a fantastic example of that. So this was like Landon's experience with Death Note as she told it to me, is that the beginning of it, like the first part of it, all the way up until we get to the good light arc is like excellent, amazing. Oh my God, chef's kiss, right? So good. But then you get to good light arc, it's a, it's a little bit boring. And then it comes well, back also, and then the, yeah, I go ahead. Say, it doesn't even cut, like, it's also like misinterprets yes. the characters. And yeah. that's my, that's like the, the ultimate sin for me, where yeah. it's like, okay, you have set up a world that is imperfect with an imperfect character. And mm-hmm. then you're trying to sell me that this character is perfect if one imperfect thing changed. Right? Bullshit. Well, the thing, about, shit. the thing about the good light arc is I feel like the authors must have known it was kind of bad because to make it okay, they gave us the beautiful L and light handcuffed capoeira fighting scene, um, which is the only thing I really even I just rewatched it. And I barely remember the good light arc, arc, arc except for that scene, because it's the only good thing. And so I, then, remember, <laughs> I remember the whole thing. And it's terrible. Oh God, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> So we get to part two and we think like, oh, this is like the opportunity to like make it good again. We've got some, you know, new detective characters, right? I know we don't have L anymore, but like there's potentially they're expanding things out, making it more worldly. But the problem is, is the whole thing was built on light versus L. So without L, it's not Death Note anymore. And it never recaptures that magic of like the first like 12 to 14 episodes that's so good until you get to the very end. The last episode is still pretty satisfying, but everything up until then is so bad that it's kind of lost you by then. But if you remember part two Death Note well, I promise you it's because the last episode still makes you feel something. The rest of it doesn't. I was tuned out by then. Yeah, I feel nothing. I I feel nothing. people are. Yeah. And the people that remember Um, it fondly are just like, all they really remember is the final episode. I think what they remember is the conceit. Yeah. I think that this conceit of the show, as well as the second season, like the second part in itself, is so clever and so good that people want to like it on the idea alone. Yeah. But they don't. No one actually likes it because the conceit, the, the, the show does not live up to the idea. Uh, it seems like Sasha's was the same experience. So she says, God, it was so funny because I haven't read this in ages. I only read the manga, but this makes me want to reread it because I do remember there being so many additional characters I did not care about. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If it's not light and L, who cares? Who cares? cares? Yeah. It's so tough when you build a season one out of certain dynamics and then decide to kill off those dynamics and and like the only thing that i can like really relate it to in recent history uh that that kind of fell off after it was like jessica jones do you remember that where they had like a great they had an amazing they had an amazing villain so good if first season of jessica jones is so good oh my god you just give me all these memories of david Tennant and jessica jones and he's so so good (laughs) i would love to do a deep dive on jessica jones because i it's my favorite marvel oh the first season is so good uh the the first season is fantastic and then there is no possible way to live up to that dynamic yeah and spoiler alert they kill off the villain in the last episode because they have to. Yeah, it's the same uh, and there's as Death no Note. they get written into a hole. They write themselves into a freaking hole. And there's no way to move forward other than to kill them off. Mm-hmm. And then the conception of like continuing to move move forward means that nothing's ever going to live up to it. Yep. And it's so hard if you've built a premise around a show in a first season that nothing is going to be able to live up to it because yeah. you've written yourself into a hole. And that's yeah. what happened here. Yeah, Ch- Sasha, you're totally right. I that is basically you just summed up our thesis statement. Of, yeah. of part two of Death Note, a hundred percent. So, for those of y'all that don't remember part two of Death Note, which is probably most people, because there's not really much memorable memorable about it, um, we do have a summary. Landon, let's go ahead and do the summary so we can start getting into the um, yes. into the like nitty gritty of it. Okay, so summary. So of it Death is Note, a part two. I'm gonna say it is a weave episode, so that means Karen's gonna do our fun little summary here. If you don't remember part two, like most of the human race. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a Karen summary time. Okay. Summary so time. four years later, cults that worship Kira have risen, and two young men raised as potential successors to L are revealed. That is Nier and Mello. Mello joins the mafia, while Nier joins forces with the U.S. government. But both of these guys have the same goal, which is capture Kira, right? So Mello kidnaps director Takamura, who Light then kills. So then Mello kidnaps Saya, remember Light's sister that's only in like two episodes, and then they exchange Saya for a death note. So Mello gets his hands on a death note, right? And Mello uses that death note to kill almost all of Nier's team because Mello's goal is to find Kira before Nier does. Like, he just, he wants to fight Nier, okay? So then what happens is a Shinigami named Sido, so this is a new Shinigami, goes to Earth to reclaim his notebook and ends up meeting and helping Mello. Light uses... um his notebook that they still have, right, in the Japanese police force to find Mello's hideout. But um, Soichiro, uh, Soichiro is killed in the mission. Mello and Nier then exchange information, and Mello kidnaps Mogi and gives him to Nier, okay? Kira supporters then attack Nier's group, but Nier's group ends up escaping. During all of this, Aizawa becomes incredibly suspicious of Light and how Light's been reacting to all of this stuff going on around them. And so Aizawa decides to go meet with Nier and tell Nier about these suspicions, right? And as then uh, they kind of have this conversation, suspicion falls again on Misa, right? Light passes Misa's death note to a fervent supporter of Kira named Teru Mikami. Okay, that's the delete, delete, delete guy. All right. He also appoints newscaster Kiyomi Takada as Kira's public spokesperson at the same time, right? Yes. Um, Nier uh, has Mikami followed while Aizawa's suspicions of light are confirmed, right? So at this point, everyone kind of knows what's going on. Um, realizing that Takata is connected to Kira, Mello captures her. Mello loves a good kidnapping. It's like his favorite thing. Um, Takata then kills, uh, Mello, but then Takata is killed by Light. Uh, Nier arranges a meeting then between Light and the current Kira task force members from Japan. Light tries to have Mikami, uh, kill Nier as well as all of the task force members, like everyone there. But Mikami's death note fails because it has been replaced with a decoy. So then they catch Mikami. They go review the names that Mikami wrote down and only Light's name is missing, which proves Light is Kira. Aizawa was right. Okay, Nier was right. Everybody was right. Light has an extreme manic episode then and ends up grievously wounded by a bullet from Matsuda. Okay, Light tries to run away and Ryuk then commits a mercy killing by writing Light's name in the death note and Light dies. Okay, that is how the anime version of Death Note ends. If anyone there is like, wow, those are a lot of names that we don't know and a lot of people we don't care about and a lot of things just happened. What? Yeah. So was I. And I watched the show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Out of everyone we just talked about, the only ones that anyone would care about would be Light, Misa, and Matsuda. Everyone else either is not in part one or is so little in part one, you don't give a fuck. Here's the deal. I I could I could find myself caring about his sister. Yeah, but just they don't because that's like but that's mostly because like light. That I'm just like, oh, that could be an interesting character thing. And then they don't let us. Yeah. That's the only other character in there that I was like, oh, that I I know who that is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, and Ryuk. That's right, Sasha. Did you know that Ryuk was Landon's favorite character upon watching this show? I'm sure you, that probably makes a lot of sense to you. <laughs> Chaos demon. <laughs> yes. Uh, no, I think that uh, Light is the You did a great job summarizing a story that has no purpose <laughs> the purpose is like oh shit we can't let light win because we think he's bad actually oh shit well, how are we going to kill him <laughs> <laughs> it's like i can imagine like being like wow there are teenage boys now writing anti 
anti-government, anti-people manifestos and use and citing the sources of Death Note. We really need to like show our audience the consequences of the actions. And how can we do that in the most contrived and just <laughs> confusing, uncaring way? Mm-hmm. You know, that did happen. Their Death Note has popped up in like weird yes, um, like, crime cases. Of course. Are you yeah. kidding me? It's about a psychopathic teenage boy who wants to rule the world with his own form of justice and become a god. Mm-hmm. What nar- What narcissistic young man is not going to be like that that is my hero oh and then also be loved by millions of people mm-hmm. like because people love death note so therefore must love light yeah for sure i mean the same thing I, I we talked about last episode death note went through a lot of the same um pushes and pulls in its fandom as the breaking bad fandom did in relation to how uh they felt about light same as how breaking bad fandom felt about walter white the same patterns all happened and it just, so of course, of course people use this as a manifesto and and, yes. and yeah, it's a hundred percent a like the writer sitting there and being like, okay, let's get a glimpse into the world, what the world looks like after and the consequences of that, because we can't let the villain win because mm-hmm. that's what they did. They let yeah. the villain win, even though the villain is the protagonist that we're, we're rooting for, he had success. And then people were like, yeah, bad people should win. Like, mm, uh, mm, wait, <laughs> just a second, you guys. Just, like that, actually. That's not the thesis. That's not the thesis. <laughs> we have to go to the thesis. This is the thesis. <laughs> and then everyone's like, this is not what the show was supposed to be. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, Or this manga is supposed to be. All right. Mm-hmm. So that leads us, I think, into something that you said very important, that this was what happened in the anime. Yes. Which means there are differences between the manga and the anime. Yeah, so this Big is ones. not this is not what happens in the manga. Um two big things that are incredibly different in the manga are the length first of all. So the anime uh director correctly recognized that part 2 was ass, okay? It was bad. And so he is like, okay, in the manga Part one and part two are not super different in length, but in the anime, part two is like super shrunk. Okay. It's not very long. Like it's like basically like a little more than a quarter, I want to say, of the whole thing is part two. Yeah, it's tiny. So the whole thing is 37 episodes. The Mm -hmm. first part is 25 of those Mm -hmm. 37. So 12 episodes uh, are dedicated to part two, which is equal to half of the series of the manga. So yeah, it's, it's tiny. Part two is tiny. Okay. Um, So that's one big difference. So everything is kind of squished in the anime. Which also is what part of like what makes it feel chaotic and like yes. sitting there and being like so much is happening and I don't have time to care about any of these. Yeah. And also like what caused the loss of charm almost in like liking the character. Like part of the thing that I liked about Light was that he would go off of on tangents and so would L and all of those tangents had to be cut for time because Pretty they much. needed to get through plot. Yeah. And and the problems that exist in the manga then are exacerbated in the anime. So I'll give you a good example. Um, does anybody remember who Matt is? I bet you're like, who the fuck is Matt? That's because he's barely in the anime, but he's also pretty unremarkable in the manga. But what little he gets in the manga is even chunk more in the anime. So if you don't remember Matt, he is um he is Mello's like helper guy. Okay. And then this in the anime, there's a standoff where he's like oh. driving, and then the the police kind of like encircle him. He has a name. Yes, he has a name. His name is Matt. And uh, and then he's like, you're not going to shoot me. And the police are like, bam, bam. Um, and they shoot him. Right. So in the manga, not it's not that he has a big role in the manga. He's pretty forgettable in the manga, too. But he's even extra super forgettable in the anime. As Lana just said, he had a name. Yes, he had a name. <laughs> I was just they like, wow, this once. thing's happening. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're not going to shoot me. Something Japanese people believe of cops. I mean, (laughs) but then they do. (laughs) But then they do. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Because I don't just Japanese cops aren't any better, I'm sure. So uh, so it's very different. So it's very different specifically because of the shrinkage. Okay, but substantively, 
that doesn't change too much, but there is one large substantive change, and um, that is Light's death. Okay, so we have a whole section at the end where we're going to talk about Light's death, and I will explain then the differences between Light's death in the manga and Light's death in the anime, and why those differences really super impact how you feel leaving the story. Um, but, uh, but I just want to acknowledge here on the differences that Light's death is a major, major one. When I found out that Light died differently in the book, I was like, oh my God. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I sent Landon the, that, that chapter. It's like the next to last chapter of the manga when he actually dies. Um, and you can see like, it's totally different. The vibe is totally different. Yeah, you know, like like conceptually, it like it, it seems like it's the same, but when you read it, it's like this is not the same thing at it's all. It's so much more impactful for the thesis. I feel yeah. in the in the manga. Anyway, we'll talk yeah. about it. Yes, we uh, are but talk yes, about that. we just wanted to recognize and just put you it in your mind. The manga is very different than the anime, um, and that perhaps I mean it's still bad, but perhaps you'll like <laughs> the manga more because there's like. The ending's more satisfying. To, to, in the the ending's more satisfying, and there's opportunity to get attached to characters that we didn't care about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's still um, not likely to happen, but it could happen in the manga, where it kind of can't happen in the anime. <laughs> like it's really hard. <laughs> Speaking about characters we don't care about. Oh God. <laughs> oh wait, hold on. Yeah, we have an ad go? break first. Do Hang we have on. an ad break first? I think we have an ad break first. Oh, okay, we have an ad break first. Okay, let's uh, do it. Ad break. Ad break. This is me being unprepared. Uh, let's just talk about, you know, let's just talk about for a second uh, the wonderful world of picking something out of random. First of all, uh, we are moving Hunger Games from next month. We should say that first. Oh, uh, we yeah, were originally yeah. going to read we were originally going to read Catching Fire, uh, which you could have gotten on audible.com slash enter stage window. Uh, we were originally going to read it for the month of May, but then my May and Karen's May decided to be the busiest month of the year. Yeah. Uh, decided to just blow up on itself. Yeah, so, so uh, we're not gonna we're not gonna have really a super normal stream schedule for um, Interstage Window in May in general. Okay, um, it's gonna be a little bit different. So because of that, Catching Fire is actually gonna be for um, the next month. Okay, so not May, but June is when we're gonna talk about Catching Fire. So if you would like to do a read along with us, you can get the audiobook on audibletrial.com slash Interstage Window. I I do recommend it. It's um voiced by the ineffable Tatiana Mason Lee, okay, Miss She Hulk herself. And she's really great. She's a really great um voice for Katniss in the book version. So I do recommend that. Yeah, and it's uh it's fantastic. I think that I think that as where we are in the world right now, everyone could use a reread of this series. So I am so incredibly glad that we are going to be doing it. Yeah, um, for sure. And, you know, that's where we're going to leave it. There's a lot of death in that book. There's uh, a lot of death. Because <laughs> I can't pull another book out of my ass, and I totally forgot that it was in this early. Usually usually I give myself, like, 45 minutes, and then I sit there and I go, oops, I got to pick a book, and then I think of one, and I can't do that right now. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> well, y'all should get Catching Fire anyways, yeah. because that's what we're going to be reading, um, and it's real good. Yeah, yeah. All right. Players we don't care about. People we don't care about. Characters we don't care about. Uh, well, we mentioned them quite a bit. So let's talk about first Nier and Mello. Okay. So, okay. Nier is basically like lawful L and Mello is like chaotic L. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um. So they basically... There's also wanna... like... This concept of good and bad there yeah, too because yeah. we have we have a version of them working with the cops and a version with yeah. them working with the mob and uh, a version that's like set on they're both set on finding light or Kira for the right reasons in their mind mm -hmm. and neither of them are L like like. <laughs> That's really their one character flaw is neither of them are L. Like, Nier, <laughs> Nier tries to be so much. Like, yeah. he crouches. 
constantly. Mm -hmm. And he does all the puzzles. So it's like funny. Okay, so basically what happened with these characters is they took L and they were they like, you know, split him in half, okay? And Nier got like all of L's demeanor. He got the the childishness, he got the playing with puzzles, okay? And then Mello gets like L's drive, he gets L's sweet tooth, and he gets L's willingness to play outside the rules because he wants to win so fucking bad. Okay, that's basically yeah. what happens. And when you split the character like this, you create two less dynamic, more boring characters instead of just no one, one cares cool about character. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's all they're like. Here are the best parts of L. Let's make two characters, but also not make L. Yeah, like it was better when all of these traits were in one character. Truly, true. It it made an interesting thing because also like I don't. Like, I had a tough time caring about L and his, like, want to defeat Kira. Uh, I, I I got there eventually, um, but I had a tough time with us. With the two of them, I'm just kind of like, mm, why? Yeah, exactly. Light already beat L. These guys I don't have to worry about. Mm-hmm. <laughs> also, I love that you called him Chaotic L, and you know that he's Chaotic L because he just straight up took a bite out of that Hershey's bar that obviously should have been broken into chunks first. I mean, you know when he eats a Kit Kat, he just bites it. He does not break it in half. And from the side. Yeah. Truly. Yeah, he just <laughs> like a, he just, a bite like, out the side. It. Yeah, absolutely and he does. And that's how you know he's a special, he's a special <laughs> And then the Is that when is... people eat candy bars wrong? It's true. I mean, why? Why? <laughs> you've, you've ruined to- it. You've ruined the They're broken the into pieces now. for a reason. Come on, guys. <laughs> Flashbacks to high school. I know, right? So basically with these two characters, the problem is, is because they are L split in half, you now need both of them to make cr- these moves to be able to catch them. So kind of what happens is that Mello is out here doing his chaotic bullshit, right? And uh, and because of the chaotic bullshit, like, um, risks that he's willing to take, Nier kind of then doesn't have to do anything to prove his thesis. He just says, this is my thesis. And then Mello goes out and does all the things to prove the thesis right. And then Nier gets the glory of catching Kira. And it's like, what? what? Like, but Mello did all the work, my dude. Mello did all the work and you're just here at the ending just swooping in and taking the glory like what the fuck is wrong with you it makes them both unlikable yes and it also like (sighs) I feel like that they tried to to develop a relationship because we they knew that we were going to miss the relationship and dynamic between Elle and Light Mm. And so they almost not only wanted to like have that cat and mouse game with them, with them trying to catch Kira, there was also like this weird energy between the two of them mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> that they, they tried rivals. to like, yeah, it was trying to like inspire that same sort of energy that Ellen Light had, yeah. uh, but it not be hunting each other, it being like, oh, we'll go, who gets there first? Yeah, yeah. And so it like just, they've got this it, rivalry, but it's like. Oop, I just dropped my headphones. So I can't hear nothing. Hang on. Oh. It fell flat on its face. They got this weird rivalry, but it's not like a real rivalry because it's kind of just like Mello really wants to beat Nier very badly and Nier just doesn't give a fuck. Like it's not consensual. It's not like tit for tat like it was with Light and L, where they very much were competing like with each other. Yeah. And then like not only that, but like the Light and L ridiculousness of like light doing something and then l figuring out what light is going to do before light does it like Uh, that game of cat and mouse was ridiculous in the first season but believable because it was cute because the relationship like that just was it was it became so unbelievable when you threw two boys at it that it was just like i don't this doesn't know this is not how this works yeah, well, like one of the elements that makes the the L and the light cat and mouse game so interesting and fun, um, and and you're you're like able to suspend that disbelief is that L takes these extra steps that neither Nier nor Mello take. So, for example, he's like, 
oh, but Light, you're the first kind of like real friend and equal that I've ever had. And, you know, you kind of don't really know if he's telling the truth, but you can easily conceive of a situation where that is really truly how he feels. And nothing like that ever happens between Nier and Mello, nor between like Nier and Mello, the way they relate to Light. So there is no like other uh, situation where you can imagine that like these characters get along and could just be buddies, which was so such an appealing part of the light and L dynamic. Yeah, there was no there was no depth. I mean, not only was there no depth to the characters, there was no depth to the relationships, which mm-hmm. made everything feel surface level, which yeah. made overall then the point that was being tried to make as shallow as the characters within the show. Yeah. Like, why do I care about the the large overarching political implications if I don't care about the individuals involved? It right? felt, it, yes, it feels very much like, here's the deal. Like, the first season felt very much like, oh, I am on the edge of when, sorry, I love metaphors. Uh, I'm on the edge of, like, when a pool goes deeper and I could step off and then, like, just plummet deep into a pool. And then going from season two, which is like, I'm hanging out in the kiddie pool. Yeah. Like that, like there was so much possibility in the first season and no possibility in the second season. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's just so obvious what they're doing. And so the characters are very base level just to service the plot. That's all they do. They don't have, you know, inner lives that are just their own outside of the plot. Yeah. Not at all. Yeah. So, uh, we, you know, Nier and Mello, um, yeah, I'm sorry if, like, these are your favorite characters, but they suck. Sorry. You deserve better. You, you deserve better favorite characters. You do. You deserve if better. These are, if these are your favorite characters, you deserve better favorite characters. It's true. Let me, uh, listen, if these are your favorite characters, leave a comment, let me know, DM me directly, and I will direct you to better characters. <laughs> either in this show or others because i will i will go on a scavenger hunt that you're like actually i just need two weird boys trying to compete for the same prize and i'm like i will find you a better way to do this trope than this than these characters okay yeah okay what sasha says is actually true okay i know this won't make sense to you landa but maybe someday we'll watch code geass if your favorite characters oh my god thank you so much for the howl lunar thank you so much and i do see your resub by the way lunar we're gonna do pins um later for some for some resubs i saw your your one that came in after stream so yes if these are your favorite characters you should go watch code geass okay code geass basically is like you know what near and mellow could have been cool i'm gonna make them cool so yeah, you could go watch Kogi. Yes, you like it better. Maybe next year. <laughs> no, I have one picked out for next year. No spoilers, yes. but I have one picked out that yes. I think we, like. we 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 did we did mention that. But anyway, yeah. uh, yes. So let's then move on to something that we wanted to talk about last time, but felt more real to talk about this time, and kind of like the bulk of our episode, mm-hmm. and that is. The women of Death Note. Yeah. Uh, There aren't many. Yeah. The ones that are, are pretty weak. The director themselves has, has stated that they regret not putting more women representation into both the manga and the, and the show. Mm -hmm. Um, And the description and, and depiction of women in this show truly shows that there were no women creating this show Mm -hmm. at all because uh it's really tough to wrap your jaws around how women are treated so we're going to kind of just talk about it for a second yeah so we're gonna talk about four ladies in particular starting with um with the the beautiful misa misa Okay, Misa Misa is the only female character in Death Note that gets significant screen time and depth. Um, And that's kind of a problem because she is outwardly like kind of the the ditzy blonde, right? Mm -hmm. And here's the problem with Death Note. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say her greatest contributions to Death Note are the fact that she is in love with somebody who is abusive to her. And she is attractive enough that other creatures fall in love with her. Mm-hmm. That is that it like it is it is down to 
that she is does not have the self-confidence to not be abused and that other people around her fall in love with her. That is the most interesting thing about her. Yeah. And and she is so ideologically wrapped up in kind of this idea of Kira and how much she loves Kira conceptually and uh, and how that bleeds over into her falling in love with light that like she doesn't even recognize that she's smart actually. And so mm-hmm. then she's not framed as being smart actually, but I'm here to tell you Misa's smart actually, okay? She does this a couple of times. The main episode where she is truly intelligent is the episode called Matsuda, okay? Where, this is actually in part one, but because we're talking about Misa, I'm gonna talk about it. Where she basically helps orchestrate this whole thing with entertaining the businessmen so that Matsuda can get away because he's gotten them into some hot water. And, you know, if it was not for Misa, Matsuda would be dead. Okay, he would be. And she saves him. And nobody goes, nobody says ever goes to Misa and says, hey, you know what? You're really good at knowing how to make sure people pay attention to you and when to use that and when not to use that, which of course she is. She's a model and an actress. Duh, that is her special skill. But no no character, nor does the narrative, recognize how valuable and important and skilled that makes her. Because when you nope. break down the actual story beats that she contributes, you're right, Landon, her value just comes from being willing to be abused by light. Well, like, okay, so let's break her down a little bit. The reason why uh, Mira, Misa Misa is obsessed and in love with light is because Kira killed the criminal responsible for killing her parents. Mm-hmm. By the way, we never see any sort of relationship she once had with her parents. We never understand, we never see any sort of loss that she has for the loss of her parents. We only ever see adoration for the man responsible for killing the man responsible for killing them like but we are we're never connected to the fact that there are like deeper real emotions that make that sort of love and obsession realistic of any Mm -hmm. sort of way Mm -hmm. and yes it is it is a manga there's a level of like uh, of disbelief and suspended disbelief in that we just kind of have to own it when someone is obsessed with another character but like there's nothing backing that up and we're told this we're never shown it we're simply told it and then told that this is the reason why she puts her life in danger several times the reason why she accepts uh light's behavior of her without like there is usually in terms of abuse even in characters and tv shows depicted there is a time frame in which the relationship was good in which the relationship was love bombing, in which the relationship like actually grew something so that there was a reason for someone to stay. We mm-hmm. never see that. Mm-hmm. Light tells Misa to her face that he hates her and dislikes her the moment he meets her, basically. Mm-hmm. Yep, it's and, true. Yeah. And then it's like, okay, so you are obsessed for no reason, given no narrative reason to stay with this person who then treats you like garbage. Yep. Like, where is the benefit for Misa in this relationship? Light doesn't do anything. And she makes plenty of money, okay? Mm -hmm. She does not need him. So how the heck does Light benefit Misa? He does not. She simply has the adoration for him because of what happened to her parents and you know, you're right. You just said that you're totally right. We never see how Misa truly felt about her parents. Mm-mm. We never see it. We never see, we never see any, here's the deal. Misa, like at the very, very, very thing, at the end of the day, Misa is not a character. She's a prop. Yeah. She is no better than a door or a cell phone in the show. Mm-hmm. She has no personality beyond those objects. Yeah. You're uh, right. And the most yeah and so she she is the she is in my mind one of the most truly horrific ways women can be written in modern media yeah like she is the example of how women are portrayed as objects in shows and the problem is is there's nothing it wouldn't matter if there was 
other female characters in Death Note that were like done well and treated properly. Mm -hmm. But that's just not the case because we're going to talk about three other female characters and those characters no one cares about. Okay, they're incredibly minor. Um, and, uh, they barely play a role in pushing the narrative forward. Okay. Yeah, Misa's so the this, only female character that really does. This is the representation, which like, and again, I know you can't, you can't stack everything on it, but like, we're talking about people who were fans of the show and in, in an area of the fandom that we were talking about earlier, that was like writing manifestos and cre and, you know, committing crimes in the name of, or using this as an example of. Uh, where it's like, yeah, not only do you have someone, like, a lot of young men and boys looking up to the characters like Light, but then also, like, seeing how, A, Light treats women and how the show treats women in it. And, like, that is their, then, ideology of women. Like, or that, that feeds what already exists in there. Yep, yep. Yeah, so Misa is very tragic, and um, and I do think that it is fitting at the that the last time we see her in the anime is she is like all gothed out, looking sad as fuck, um, because now she realizes that she has spent her entire life in adoration of someone who was always doomed to fail. Well, like not only spent her entire life literally, like literally, mm -hmm. she cuts her li life in half twice. Yeah. For him. So she's going to die early and he never was going to succeed. And she finally live, realizes that. She's going to live a quarter of her life for that. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Which is insane. Absolutely tragic. Misa deserves uh, better. And the, and the other thing too is that like even and even to the end, that is never considered in the show. Mm -mm. Like that's never brought up. Again, after she uses, after she gets the Shinigami eyes for the second time, that's in part two, but after she gets it for the second time, it's never mentioned again that she's, like, gonna die early. Uh, and, like, even at the end, like, it's never, there's never a thesis statement about that. She's gothed out, dressed up, gothed out, and that's the ending for her. Mm -hmm. Even to the very end, she is a prop in the show. Yep. So sad. It's so sad. But she isn't the only female character. There are other female characters, and you're like, fucking who? We're going to remind you, because they're barely there. <laughs> the first one that we're going to remind you of is my favorite, my favorite thing from last time, which is Naomi. Okay, so this is especially tragic, and it's tragic for the reasons of, like, the manga industry and how the manga industry works, right? So if you guys don't know, when you are publishing manga, you you're typically publishing it to one of several different magazines that come out weekly. So especially if yours gets popular, there's pressure to publish a new like chapter every single week. OK, so you don't really get to do too much planning ahead. You can do a little bit, but you are very limited by that strict publication schedule. There is a lot of pressure to not skip weeks. Right. So Naomi as you remember from the first part, was our character that basically finds out towards the very beginning of the show that light is Kira. And this is like literally what the authors have said about her is they realized, oh shit, she's too smart. We have to kill her. We made a mistake. Okay. So this, this is basically the second female c character that we, that we have in the, sh in the show. There's me in part one, Misa and Naomi. And uh, and the, the authors like just didn't think it through. They just didn't fucking think it through at all. And so they kill her like within almost she's like she's in like two episodes. Like she's introduced and then she's, she dies. Like it's so bad. It's so bad because they didn't even think her through. They were just like, oh, you know, this seems like a, a kind of person who would exist in the story. And they just throw her in. She's like a tool too because she's used yes. to like she's used to sh to salt to connect. She is used to connect the dots and then used to spell it out to yeah. the audience. Yeah. Uh, and then once that is done, and once that pressure is added, she's killed. Yeah, because it's literally she's just too like, smart. They wrote like her. Of... They wrote a character too smart. Pretty much because she's really just there to be like another little hurdle for light to solve because that's what part one is. It's like just light just constantly jumping over hurdles. Right. So she's just one of the many, many, many hurdles. That's it. Yeah, that's all she is. 
and and that's fine if you have that character. The problem is, is that this is like I would say the second most well represented woman in yeah. like yeah. <laughs> yeah, the problem the problem with like the female side characters in Death Note is that there is no female Matsuda, right? Like there's no female character that's fully thought through, fully fleshed out, fully realized, okay? That is the problem. The problem is not these characters individually. These characters individually are fine. They service what they're supposed to service. It's totally cool. But like Absolutely none of the characters that are female get to do things like Aizawa does, get to do things yeah. like Matsuda does, right? Get to be like fully fleshed out, understandable characters. You know, neither Nier nor Mello gets to be a girl. You know, they have to be boys. And, that's and the they problem. could have been. Like, yeah. that's the other thing. To, none of the cops, none. We don't see a single female cop except for her. And even yeah. then, she's not a cop. Yeah, she's She's retired. no longer a cop. She's, she's a retired, retired. cop. <laughs> We don't see a single female cop in the entirety. And and that is, again, bias and patriarchy and all of that. But it's being shown here in, in the show. Like, it just hits you over the it's head. Especially when, especially when you are someone who, like, looks for that and wants that representation. And you're sitting here and being like, this, this, this like, is this what is I it. have. This, this is, is it. it. And it's not fair because that's not it. We also have... Saya. Saya. Okay, so it has been noted in a couple of different interviews that the authors felt uncomfortable with writing more about both Light's sister and Light's mother. Um, it made them very uncomfortable, basically, what Light was doing to them and the impact that his actions would have on their lives, which is why in part one, they basically get no screen time. Okay, so that is why. It's because the authors were literally uncomfortable with exploring what it would mean for the family dynamic or to have like somebody like light, right? They just couldn't do it. And so they just pretend they don't exist, basically. And so then we get to part two, and uh, there's been a time skip, right? And so then we need... <laughs> Mello's got to kidnap somebody, and it's like, who can he kidnap? Who does actually, Light care about enough? Yeah, who does Light actually care about? Oh, or who maybe does the his... audience care about enough that Light, that it would be le believable that Light Yeah, about his them. sister, okay? So basically, they do that, and then you find out Light doesn't give a flying fuck about his sister. No. But his, his dad does at least, at least his dad cares about his, his sister. And so then the dad goes and exchanges the death note. But it doesn't matter. She's so traumatized. She's basically like a talking vegetable. So now we don't have to write her anymore. Mom and, and Sayu can just go do their own thing in crazy land. They She's were once again now. used as a tool. And then our third, our fourth and final, four women, fourth and final woman, uh, which is Kiyomi. And Kiyomi is Light's ex-girlfriend from college kind of she was in an episode in part one yeah where and it's, it's implied they went on a light, few dates more than one yeah date. the light went on a few dates with her while he was also dating misa and that was to keep up appearing appearances that he was like dating um and that she was like that he he acknowledged that she was really pretty uh and then <laughs> fast forward guess to, what she's a cure uh, lover <laughs> The Kira lover. Turns out she's a Kira lover and she's going to become the face of Kira mm -hmm. and the spokesperson for Kira so that Light once again can manipulate a woman into doing what he wants with them and then getting nothing in return. Like they, like there is nothing that is exchanged. There is no, like, human nature is to like get something whether that be attention whether that be love whether that be money whether that be fame and recognizing he offers them none of that no, he offers <laughs> and they're them still nothing. like oh you're kira of course i'll do anything yeah and it's even worse when it comes to kiyomi because like misa we she tells us this conceit that she has like why she feels like she should go out of her way to help kira 
Um, you know, because he helped with uh, with the person that, that killed her parents, right? We get no such thing with Kyomi. With Kyomi, we are told she is purely ideologically motivated, okay? So there's a difference between, like, being the type of person that thinks Hitler was right, actually, and being the type of person that when Hitler calls you up, you'd be like, sweet, that sounds great, let me help you, you know? So we never get any sort of depth to Kiyomi to understand why she's willing to go out of her way for like just her simple ideology. Because most people do not have a consistent ideology or morals within them. They have like somewhat, like a little bit, but they kind of just like float around and they do what feels right. That's most people. Most people have not like fully thought through the logical consistencies of their ideology, right? And so like with Kiyomi, if she is so ideologically motivated, I want to understand why? You know, is she somebody that has political ambitions? Is she some, did she study um, poli sci in school? Like, um, what radicalized she, her? Yeah. Is like, she, what exactly? Like, what did it? But we don't know. We have no idea. Or what can she, like, because that's the other thing, too, is that when you're in that deep, not only are you like waiting by the phone for the person to call you up so that you can help them radicalize the world. You also want to contribute mm. to it. Mm -hmm. So it's like, oh, we never see her also sit there and be like, oh, but if you're, what if we do this or this or add yeah. to it in any way? Yeah, she she's just, just perfectly orders. content with following orders with no recognition, nothing in return, and completely just passive in her, yeah. in her, in her submission to Kira. And then, and further, when she is, like, having these, like, passive reactions, you even see her, like, morally kind of thinking about, like, well, can I be the one that pulls the trigger? Can I really do that? Do I really have that within me? Like, she even, she, she even, like, has a little bit of doubt in her ability to execute on her ideology, which is yeah. very normal. Um, I think most people would, but I just, I want a little bit more background onto why Kiyomi feels how she feels because she's not crazy or she would have been like, yeah, give me the gun and pull the trigger right now. It sounds great. You know, she doesn't have that type of reaction. She has like, oh my gosh, really? I can't believe you would give this to me. I'm not sure I can do it. Which is like, why? Why are you not sure that you could do it? <laughs> I want to know. know. We don't know I anything know. about her. Yeah, we, we don't know, know anything about her. All like... We don't know. We have no clue. And he's, and yet she's very important to the plot. Like if it were not for Kiyomi, things would not have gone down the way they went down. And yet we have no idea why she is motivated the way she's motivated. We're just told a, that's she ideologically agrees. That's it. That's it. She's that's a tool. Mm -hmm. She is a tool and to move the story forward. Mm -hmm. And this is what happens when mm -hmm. you write for the purpose of just when you write women characters for the purpose of pushing through a, a male's narrative. Yeah. And without making them deep is that you get four women with speaking lines, three of them abused by light mm -hmm. and one of them murdered by him. Mm -hmm. It's very disappointing. It's very disappointing because all the, the male characters, the reactions that they have are very natural. Like in part one, what's his name that ends up quitting because he can't, he can't like reconcile how to yeah. help catch light and like take care of his family at the same time. So he quits, right? You have well, Matsuda. Se several of them. Yes. Or like you have, um, or you have Matsuda who kind of like, you know, he's young, li like light is. And so he kind of like sympathizes with Kira a little, but he knows that Kira is ultimately wrong. And so like he has these, act which is, you know, that makes a lot of sense. Um, you have other, you have like Aizawa who gets suspicious of uh, of light because like he's a good detective and he oh, does want the, to catch Kira. All the businessmen who yeah. like, who are corrupt in their own selfishness, selfishness, mm -hmm. like, and have reactions based off of, like, the information that they gain every single time mm -hmm. in order to gain power. Yeah. Like, every single character, every single male character that is on screen as long as these guys are, is developed tenfold more mm -hmm. than these yeah. ones are. Yeah. And I just, you know, I'm not saying that radical newscasters aren't out there. Obviously, I'm aware that Fox News exists, too. And I, I know some of those people must believe the bullshit that they're saying. Some of them must. Right. But there's like a reason. And but there's a just, reason. Yeah. If someone is like if, if someone's mind is so structured like that, I want to know why. 
because otherwise their character doesn't make any sense because most people do not think this way. Most people have to be propagandized to, to be able to think this way. It doesn't naturally happen. Or a realistic sort of reaction of any sort of thing. Yeah. Like, it it doesn't need to be that every single one of these needed to have an episode of backstory. They just needed to have a line or two, especially the ones that are in an episode or two. They just needed to have a line or two explaining to us why they are there and why it matters. Yeah. Especially like, and why their reaction is the way it is. Mm-hmm. Kiyomi w- being the the most the most I, realistic of that. Yeah, I would have loved to have a Misa like line for Kiyomi where she's like, "Kira, say you know, Kira killed the killer that killed my parents." Like at least for Misa, it makes sense why she keeps doing the stupid things and lets light abuse her. It, it gives <laughs> it gives at least a. Li- I mean, it doesn't yeah. it doesn't give two seasons a majority of the episodes of, yeah. reason, of reasons, but it does give more a reason than yeah. Even Whatever we get. I feel like it should should be more fleshed out. At least I know why. <laughs> yeah. At least I can at least I am capable of sitting there and being like, okay, let me build a character around the why that makes sense and just like look at it from the Harley Quinn Joker sort of perspective. Yeah. Like like let me put that trope on there. Yeah. For like um, our role player fan fiction selves, we would if we yeah. wanted to like write Kiyomi, we would have to add so much to her to make her character make sense and be able to write her with motivations. It's ridiculous. Yes. So those are the women of Death Note. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, yep. All right. This is also the biggest issue that we had with Death Note. And that was politics is an afterthought now this is a com this is not just death note this is a very common thing we talked about this issue a lot in our harry potter episodes uh we probably mention it more often than most media (laughs) divers podcasters do uh because we are obviously very politically minded we like to educate ourselves on the politics of the world and also politics feed culture that feeds understanding of why stories are written that way that the way yeah so we're always like political inconsistencies like everywhere like we point it out everywhere guess what it's in death note too very politically so and 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 we're not like sitting there and being like oh we have to have a perfect world that makes 100 percent sense like we we can forgive a little bit but what would really shows is the uh I think what's really important is those examples of how politics slip in from the creator and feed assumptions and you can develop assumptions about a show based Mm -hmm. off of those politics. Mm -hmm. And so this particular show is very apolitical for a political, at least in the part one, and we talked about this a little bit, it tries to be apolitical for a show that is not apolitical. Yeah, the, this conceit, show, the entire the conceit, conceit of the show is, is so political. political. It's so political. Uh, but it does its best to try to like be like, oh, nah. <laughs> 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 yeah. It, it's fine. It's yeah. okay. It doesn't matter. Uh think about the action though. Yeah. Right? Like it and and that's something that we had an issue with in part one. And then in part two, as Karen said earlier, it became a like, oh politics is necessary in this and also the storyline we want to do involves politics so let's start seeing where we can jam politics in even Mm -hmm. if it doesn't fit right even if it doesn't make any sense let's just see where it fits in the holes because it needs to be in there Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh and that just creates a lot of fucking issues with the foundation of shows So in Death Note in particular, basically, this is the main reason why when you watch Death Note, it doesn't feel make you feel anything. Right. So you have all these new characters introduced, um, you know, as Sasha was saying, and as we've been saying that, like, you don't care about. Right. So then the main thrust of the story is the overall politics. And if you're going to make politics the forefront and your characters the background, you better have a real serious political message or moral that you want people to get out of it. So I'll give you an example where someone does this well, and that is a three-body problem, which is a- Oh, great uh, book. 
Oh, amazing book. book. Okay, really good trilogy. Most actually, I was, about that. I was about to pull that up. Anyway, oh, really? It's really good. It was, it maybe was, it was one we'll... of my it was one of my Kindle recs for yeah, uh, maybe for someday we'll talk books. about Three Body. I love Three Body, but it, that book, most of the characters are pretty forgettable. Um, Mm -hmm. but because you're so intrigued with all of these different like political ideas and the way humanity is moving as a whole, you, you still feel swept along by the story. Uh, whereas when you have a story that is focused on individuals like Death Note is light and L's cat and mouse game, that's the focus. And then you try to pull it back. Um, you have to be really good at then showing all of the different machinations of people as a whole but that's not what death note does death note still attempts to focus on individuals but it just chooses to not flesh them out and so then you end up with both boring characters and boring political messaging and so why the fuck do i care i have nothing to care about in death note part two Nothing. And and it doesn't resemble any like I'm going to care about something if I can re if I can relate to it. Mm-hmm. The reality is is like that's just how my brain works. As soon as I understand the world and I understand what there is to care about in the world, I will I will care at least minimum. Might ha- hate that I'm caring, but I will care. <laughs> yeah. At least like, the, it makes you want to turn the page, you know? Yeah. When the politics don't line up get out of here yeah so if they don't line up then i need characters to care about right like i had him for one but i don't have any here because l is not there so why do i care and others do this to themselves all the time they close themselves in and then try to expand the world around them and the reality is that the world as you grow truths become universal yeah so so not only like and and I can only really like talk about books in this way, but it's things like, oh, a book that starts from first person point of view, anything that exists within there can be considered unreliable narrative can be considered unreliable character can just be considered also like assumptions of the truth of this person. Mm-hmm. As soon as it becomes third person, then it is no longer just the character it starts bleeding into the world. And then you start having different characters' perspectives. And that becomes universal truths. Yeah. And when you start filling in the universal truths of a world that you had already developed, you're shit yeah. out of luck, my friend. <laughs> yeah, if you're going to if you're going to start actually paying attention to the politics of what you've written, you actually have to have thought them out from the beginning because that's basically what happens to Death Note. They get they they finish part one and they're like, shit, we got to pay attention to the politics now. But we didn't really think about that in the beginning. So now it's kind of like shoehorned in and it's not good. And that's what makes the execution bad. And like how to make it better, truly, honestly, is to get rid of part two and just have Light and L Hannibal themselves off of a cliff together. That's that's how to fix it. Part two shouldn't exist. Or don't, or like acknowledge that this is the issue. Because I think that this is something that CW shows do extremely well, is that they acknowledge that like there is an issue here. There is a world without politics. So they don't try to then incorporate, pol- they they swerve. They sit there and they go, can't do it because it won't make any sense. So we're not going to even try. And that at <laughs> least is honest. Right? Like, yeah. that's the anti-Harry Potter anti-Harry Potter world where it was like, oh, Harry Potter, all of a sudden she started developing the wizarding world and then everything didn't make sense. <laughs> and then we all it's laughed like that at her. Exi- <laughs> it's, like, it's like Twilight. It, like, is what Stephanie Meyer did where she's like, this continues to, like, not make any sense. Gonna let it. And I'm think- never going to explore the world outside of this because I'm just gonna let it. Yeah, and I think when you have have a situation that's like a CW show where things are more soap opera-y, you can get away with a lot of that stuff. Yes. Um, but uh, but if you've not got a, think, a soap opera or that or anything like that in your structure, I think it's very hard. But I think manga, because of its episodic releases, could if it chose not to go political. Mm-hmm. Death Note made a conscious choice to go political. Yeah, there is a world in which they could have written a season two that was as apolitical as the rest of the world, and that would not have been 
I'm not saying it would have been good, but it would have been, been the choice. This. <laughs> it it, it would have been, been the. This. It would have been the uh, the choice to not acknowledge the politics. Yeah. To well, not cause... try to teach the lesson of L is bad, light is bad, yeah. because in order to teach that lesson, you have to acknowledge the impact that light has on the world. Mm-hmm. And you know, there are animes that treat politics as an aesthetic choice as opposed to an actual like moral choice um and they could have done something like that so i'll give an example um kill la kill i think is a great example of that and i know i know you've not seen this landon but basically um it's a very like fascism is bad actually um kind of anime like that's it at its core but it doesn't meaningfully explore any of the politics that it's talking about it's just saying like authoritarianism sucks and we should never do that um but it's very aesthetic like uh in in japanese there is a relation between the word fascism and and the word for clothing. And so there's all these weird things with clothing where the characters put on clothing or get naked or there's magical clothing. Um, And there's like a whole faction that's like basically like nudists. And that's like a whole thing, right? Because it's relating, but it's aesthetically related. when When you watch it, the only political idea you come away with is like, yeah, authoritarianism sucks. That's it. Like, it's not really trying to say nothing deep. Um, but Death Note all of a sudden tries to say like a little bit deeper stuff and it just falls flat. It just falls yeah. flat. You're like, you're like expected a walk in the park and then it just hits you with the constitution in the face. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But the constitution has so many mistakes and misspellings. You're not sure what it's trying to fucking say. That's yeah. what it feels like. That's yeah. the metaphor that came into my mind. Why I said it, I don't know, but that's what happened. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty much. And, and like I said, this is not unique to to uh anime this is certainly not unique to death note this is a constant issue that we see in media of series whether it be book series tv series movie series that are desperate to continue on without the purpose of its existence being clear like yeah let the like it's so and here I'm going to get a little political myself. It is so within the world to not let the thing that is successful die because capitalism has told us that if it's successful, it must continue and live on forever. It doesn't always need to. Endings are good, actually. Endings are great. And if you thought three books ahead, stop at three books. Mm -hmm. If you thought five books, stop at five books. If you stopped at one season because you just wanted it to get greenlit, stop at one fucking season. If there weren't seeds when you were developing the plan in like of future in your head when you were developing it, it's not worth it's not worth picking it up in the back half. It's not <laughs> worth it. Because you're gonna do it it's wrong. Not worth it. Maybe, maybe for the money, money it is, but artistically well, it's yes. not worth it. Well, yeah, and then that's what I'm talking about. Like I get it. It's capitalism. And yeah. here, fast forward to me five years from now when I am a sellout that my trilogy was actually now six books. <laughs> but <laughs> right now I'm standing on the moral high ground of let it die. Let, let it, it die where it's supposed to. And that's what that's what death note should have done hey let's talk about deaths oh yes (laughs) death (laughs) destruction mayhem light doesn't die this way (laughs) so this is a major change from the manga the way that light dies so in the anime we have the religious symbolism that is added in that doesn't exist in the manga we talked about that last week go back and watch our last episode it's on my youtube channel so in the anime, um, Light is shot by Matsuda. He uh, he runs away somehow, even though he just got shot. Fuck if I know he's Superman, whatever. He's running away. He's like panting. Like he's like he's like really desperate. And he's like, oh, my God, I can't believe this. And you've got like the the choir singing all this beautiful like Christian, like stained glass looking light coming through. It's, it's very, all like it's very reminiscent yeah. of Elle's death. You know, yeah, that's all like angelic. Re- Re, right, like, re uh reunited and ha- wherever yes. they're gonna be reunited right and so like ryuk sees this and he's like oh i i give you mercy light i kill you now he writes the name okay this is in the anime all right in the manga light has his manic speech okay just like in the anime he has his manic speech it's slightly different but it's not that different and he in the end of his manic speech he is shot by Matsuda and he starts 
begging, like literally, he doesn't run away. He's like, Ryuk, kill them now. Fucking kill them. Kill Nier. Kill all these people. Kill them. Kill them. Kill them. And he's like, Ryuk, kill them. Ryuk, kill them. We're friends. Kill them. And Ryuk goes like, yeah, yeah, Light, I see you asking for my help. I'm going to help you. And he writes Light in, in the death note. And then Light dies. Okay. Which is, by the way, fantastic ending. Yes. Because from the very beginning, Ryuk is like, I'm not going to fucking help you. And then, like, after all this time, guess what he doesn't do? Fucking help him. Yeah, he's like, you're it, boring like, now, Light. Goodbye. <laughs> well, like, also, it, like, reminds us that the Shinigami are sh- creatures beyond humanity Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. like like uh, the way that i read the anime that i was like oh his time is up like they have made such a big deal throughout the anime about like not of of like light is never allowed to know how much life he has to live Mm -hmm. and so then all of a sudden he's dying alone the chorus is playing he is defeated and ryuk is like know what buddy i'll put you out of your misery so you don't die alone like this and i'll get your last 40 seconds to me it was very clear that the, his time clock was up mm-hmm. uh in the other one it feels like the shinigami was just like actually nah brah you're dead now my turn i'm gonna get all that extra time and that's gonna be me and then i'm gonna move on thanks for the laughs which is Ryuk's character from the beginning. Yep. And like, as Light is dying, Ryuk explains to him, which this exists in the anime too, but it's on one of the little like Death Note rule title cards. They don't really talk about it, but in the manga, they talk about it. Okay. Where it says that in death, for a human that has used a Death Note, they do not go to heaven. They do not go to hell. They are not reincarnated. They get nothing. They go to Mu. They go to nothingness. They go to Purgatory. emptiness. Yes, when Light yes. dies, he is just dead, period. And Ryuk explains this to him. And Light is horrified. He's horrified by the idea that nothing else exists for him. And he, like, basically feels like his whole life and his whole mission was wasted like he dies in the most existential pain that i imagine a person could ever feel in the manga not in the anime not in the anime no in the anime he just dies he's peaceful oh oh this martyr this martyr died for his cause which is like fucking because your whole your whole thesis statement is that like light's not a good person and this is not a thing that you should be following. Hey, you. No. And then you give him this death. And mm-hmm. then you take away the painful, not good, terrible, big, bad death. And you give him dying on a staircase as heaven's angels sing above him from glass and light. And L is reaching out from beyond. Like, that's what you're saying that he, how he dies? All right. Mm-hmm. We lost the plot here. We mm-hmm. don't get it anymore. Mm hmm. Yeah. So that's why I have so much mixed feelings about all of the Christian imagery that is added into Death Note. On one hand, there's a lot that I like about it. We talked about that last episode. But because of adding that in, now Light's death necessitates uh, a change to make him a martyr. And he is not a martyr. He is a bad person, period. Yeah. And, and and like not only a martyr but like blessed and approved upon yeah like like in media heaven's choir this symbolism is supposed to like symbol that the person is a good approved by god person mm-hmm. and like we got that with light a little bit there were flashbacks there but it was like that or not light with sorry L, L. L. uh there were flashbacks there but we also knew that he was the good guy he was not our good guy because we're following our protagonist is is the bad guy, but he was the one that stood for good and justice and, and he had and, re- redemption. He had redemption. He had redemption. Yeah, that's what is being offered to this character too. Yeah, no, it's bad. I don't believe it. It's silly. Yeah. Also, it just like undercuts Ryuk and his coolness mm-hmm. in every single possible way too. Yeah, because it makes. It, it kind of erases what's so different about Ryuk versus Rem, 
you know, like Ryuk only cares about being entertained. He only cares yeah. about his sinful desires being quenched, right? He wants apples and he wants entertainment. That's and it. And there's there's also like this like truth of the immortal, the immortal God, like God, but not in the way of like Christian God, but more of like an immortal being who can live forever and holds a lot of power sort of God uh, that a Shinigami is. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, the, that things that are so chasmaclitic within the world that change us humans do not phase those things, mm-hmm. which is why there's this like concept of falling in love with a human literally kills a Shinigami because mm-hmm. it's supposed to like, they're not supposed to change. They are unchangeable. And so like the concept of like falling in love and changing is a, signing a death note. Mm-hmm. But it, but then we like are studied with the idea that every Shinigami we've met doesn't change. Y- mm-hmm. Yes, Rem does end up dying to save Misa, but she's still not changed because we meet her in love with Misa. Mm-hmm. Like that's that's already that's not a change. Ryuk doesn't change. But he does in this, he does in this. And that, yeah. like, I hate that. Yeah. Because that, so, that also gives him power. Like, yeah. that gives L- light power to, like, change Shinigami. And he shouldn't have that. He shouldn't. So, yeah. um, I do still really enjoy the ending of the anime. I think the whole scene up until light runs away is good like when matsuda shoots him it is so satisfying it's like fuck yeah matsuda fuck yeah right when near is like oh you know this is we did with decoy this is how we did it i'm like yeah 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 right like that whole the end episode until we get to him running out the building is good by the way i just want to make sure that's clear i i also think this is like here's the other thing too this is good Beautifully written, beautifully done, orchestrated, drawing, all of it. It is impactful and meaningful. It is the it is the wrong ending, or it is the wrong story that this ending is on top of. Like that's the big problem with it. Is like it's beautiful. I could rewatch this scene a thousand times yeah, because I have all I, the and, and be touched and, by it. Yeah. And think that it's amazing because also like just it it, ha- it touches all of the right things. I cannot do it in good conscience connected to the character that it's connected to. Yeah. And that's what pisses me off. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Light's death, better in the manga. It Would have been is. better, however, if it happened 12 episodes earlier and they handled off a cliff. That's true. Anyway. <laughs> yes. Did it resonate? No. <laughs> It's just like that not if you're even gonna, getting into it. No, no, like if you're gonna if you're gonna make like Death Note with the politics, I want to understand like what it is that you're proposing is like what are you pointing out? You know, because we still have like this this very like cops good world. You know, we still have like, oh, the Death Note is gone now, problem solved, things can go back to normal. And it's like, well, wait, normal was bad. That's the whole reason that Light got these stupid ideas in the first place is because normal was bad, you know? So no, part two doesn't resonate. I love part one of Death Note. It's one of my favorite animes. But part two, on take, I could leave it. I'm not interested. No, it doesn't resonate with me. Does it resonate? No. I don't see myself in the show. Uh, the lack of female representation, the fact of depth of character, the messiness of the storyline, it doesn't resonate. The first 12 episodes are entertaining. The first 25 make a good story. The whole 37, I'm I'm at a wash. There was too yeah. much bad for me to like this anime. Yep. Um, so do, not only does it not resonate, but I also would rate it two stars <laughs> it, it it unfortunately ruins all the good stuff from part one mm-hmm. so for all of you out there who are posting death note video essays about like you know part two is actually genius and blah 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 no it's not because it doesn't matter how it looks on paper the execution is so poor like i agree if someone outlined death note part two i'd be like this sounds baller as fuck i want to watch I'd this be on it. But no, actually watching it, it's not good. Actually reading it, it's not good. 
Okay, it's not. It's not I'm good. sorry. No bueno. Not it's not good. So no, doesn't resonate. All right. Well, I mean, we got through this really quick. We knew it was going to be short because we didn't yeah. have a lot of good things to say. We knew that <laughs> most of our critiques were going to just exist in here. So where can you find us? All right, you can find us right here on Twitch. If you enjoyed today's stream, please drop a follow. Um, you can also find all of my VODs on YouTube. I'm putting links in the chat. So, um, oh, not that one, socials. So you definitely want to check that out. So you can go watch the season, the first um, part one episode. Also, we have a Discord server. You can join that to chat us up and also to make sure that you get those good notifications because I control them there. And then Twitter is my main social media. So you can find me on there. That's It's like 90% stream updates, but every once in a while I make another kind of tweet. Um, also, next week here, we're going to be doing uh, Stardew episode so we are still in our first year we're going to be doing the first year feast of the winter star so you can come join us for that that is usually myself kendra and kitty um we'll see if that's the cast next week it probably will be and then tomorrow right here on twitch we're going to be doing more of our 100 majora's mask run so that's that's all this the stuff about finding me landon where can people find you find me on instagram twitter or tiktok at land in maine uh i'm posted a really good poem recently that got some traction so y'all should watch it uh basically just a lot of fun a lot of poetry some fun uh little sneak peeks coming up there and just to kind of a gaze into my life uh i'm here almost every single saturday uh, unless life gets busy which it is about to so <laughs> yeah may- maybe we will uh we won't see landon <laughs> too much more uh to be honest um until, until june. like june <laughs> um but that's okay she's gonna be having lots and lots of fun um and we'll yeah. have lots and lots of fun here so let's let's next say uh goodbye to those watching on youtube so for uh for everybody watching on youtube thank you so much for watching don't forget to like comment subscribe down below and of course as always don't forget to make it a great day And don't forget to be awesome.